Not so many years ago, it was lawful to shoot waterfowl in the spring. Now, spring shooting is illegal. But every autumn, two million Americans crouch in the rushes with loaded guns and thrill to the magnificent sport of duck and goose hunting. Although spring shooting with guns is no longer allowed, more and more duck hunters are learning that it is great sport to shoot ducks with a camera or to hide in the rushes and just watch the mallards or teal or bluebills come barging into decoys undisturbed by gunfire. Among the most common of our waterfowl are the scop, generally called bluebills or broadbills. Scop are diving ducks. They feed in deep water and make a real dive for their food instead of just tipping up in shallow water as a mallard or teal does. The canvasback is the largest and handsomest of the diving ducks. But the most amusing is the chesty little ruddy duck. In the spring, the male ruddy is everlastingly showing off before his tiny bride, whose eggs are larger than a canvas bag's. Another chesty fellow is the Drake Shuffler. His figure is not too good, but in the spring, his coloring is beautiful. While watching ducks, you may see a pied-billed grebe. He can get underwater in a hurry, or if he wants to settle into a school of minnows and grab one off for lunch, he can submerge very slowly. The largest and most spectacular grebes are the western grebes, whose courtship consists in part of a rhythmic nodding of black-capped heads and a preening of the feathers on the back. In the spring, the drake pintail is a mighty fine-looking fellow, even finer looking than during the hunting season. For now, he is wearing his wedding garb, or as the birdmen call it, his nuptial plumage. Now he has the long tail feathers from which he gets his name. Perhaps twice a day, he is joined by the hen pintail, who leaves her nest to get food and water. While she feeds, the drake keeps alert for possible danger, his head held high by his long neck. When she has finished feeding, and has preened her feathers, and he is satisfied that all is safe, they both fall asleep in the sun. A drake mallard swims quickly by, and then a pretty little green-winged teal comes along. The fellow with a white crescent on his cheek is a blue-winged teal. He jealously guards his drab little mate against the attentions of any other male. During the nesting season, the males do a good deal of fighting, and the head bobbing means, watch your step, bud. Two redheads go by, and the drake slows up to scratch his head. Then they swim in and take a good look at Mr. and Mrs. Blue Wing. When they have fed a bit, the drake redhead flies off over the marsh, and the hen heads for her nest on an island. Before she really settles down on her nest, she turns the eggs with her feet. People have a notion that ducks always nest in rushes over water. Diving ducks usually do. But even redheads and canvasbacks sometimes nest on dry land, though always close to water. 
On the other hand, surface feeding ducks like mallards and teal and pintails will nest far from water. Here, high up on the sun-baked, ball-headed prairie, is a pintail's nest. While under a bit of sagebrush, half a mile from water, is the nest of a gadwall. When ducklings hatch, they often have a long and dangerous overland journey before they reach the relative safety of the nearest water. Marsh hawks do not molest waterfowl too often, but a male marsh hawk is likely to make a pass at you or anyone else who comes close to where his mate is nesting. If you come too close, the female will rise screaming from her nest. And then, in defense of unhatched eggs or fluffy youngsters, she will climb swiftly on strong wings and start dive bombing in real earnest. And while she dives at you, the red-winged blackbirds dive at her, like fighter planes pouncing on a bomber. Among the largest of all our birds are these whistling swans and the still larger and much rarer trumpeter swans. Not so many years ago, whistling swans were relatively uncommon and trumpeters almost extinct. Then laws were passed giving swans complete protection from gunners. Today, their comeback stands as a shining example of the way in which wild creatures respond to sound conservation measures. Among waterfowl, there are no better parents than Canada geese. Just look at the way those two battle cruisers guard their convoy. There is something completely majestic about these long-necked honkers, something that puts the Canada goose in a class all by himself and makes him the number one prize among waterfowlers. And of all the music produced by birds, none is more thrilling than the cry of the Canada goose. Migrating waterfowl are always a stirring sight, but especially stirring are the great waves of blue and snow geese that every spring move slowly northward through Nebraska, Minnesota, the Dakotas, and Manitoba. In enormous flocks, they come from wintering grounds along the Gulf of Mexico, bound now for nesting grounds in the Arctic. They loaf along, following the retreating snow and ice, and seeking out those fields in which an abundance of grain was left after the fall harvest. Shooting waterfowl with a camera is every bit as exciting as shooting with a gun. And when you are hunting with a camera, it is always open season, be it summer or winter, autumn or spring. Moreover, there are no bag limits. And the birds that last the longest and give the most pleasure are those you bring back on film. <laughs>